Manager, label head, entertainment producer, Scooter Braun turned a golden ear for talent and a brilliant mind for marketing into a perpetual stream of platinum hits. This is his blueprint. Tell me about playing basketball. I know you were uh, very active as a young man uh, in high school with aspirations to go to the, the NBA. My aspirations for the NBA ended when I got to high school. Okay. Because um, I started playing AAU basketball and I started realizing that God didn't give me those gifts, but I could shoot with anybody. So that was fun. So I knew I could just make a team. How did that inform the beginning of your career and how's that sort of evolved within you over time? My dad was a coach, and I used to get so frustrated with how some of my AAU teammates would treat my father, because I knew how much he was giving up to be there for them. And I would go home and see the extra time he put in to our team and to helping you know, others, and sometimes they wouldn't appreciate him. I got so frustrated, and finally I said to my dad, I was like, how do you deal with this? And he said, the thing about being a coach is the wins are yours, the losses are mine. He goes, that's what you sign up for when you become a coach. I'm not here to celebrate when I win. I'm here to give you the win. And he goes, but when we lose, I have to take the blame. And I'm okay with that. That's what a coach does. And I feel like my career, I have to play the role of coach. I have to kind of take that same mentality on, and I got that from him. So you show up your first day at college at Emory. Yeah. Did you have any idea what you wanted to do or where you were going with your life? I chose Atlanta because I knew no one there. And so when I arrived at college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just didn't want to be Scott Braun, the basketball player anymore. And so I literally came to Atlanta, took my nickname, which my best friends call me at home, Scooter, became Scooter Braun full time. I had an amazing high school experience, but I just wanted to be my own man. You know, I got there and it wasn't until I kind of started doing fake IDs and then into parties. Tell me about the fake ID business. So a buddy of mine, was selling fake IDs. I'm gonna get in trouble for this, I'm sure. I told my friend, look, this is what we're gonna do. I'm gonna be your salesman. You're gonna make me 50-50 partner. And my rule was never tell me your real name, never come back. And like the first break we had in the year, he calls me and he's like, come into New York City, meet me at this hotel, I'm throwing a party. I'm like, what are you talking about? And I go in and he's got girls running around all over the place. And one of them walks up to me and says a fake name. How are you? And I realize he's keeping in touch. And I was like, I'm out. And I never sold a fake idea again. Sure enough, you know, a couple months later, he got caught. That's what led me to parties, because the hustle had started. Okay. And um, I ended up saying to this club owner, hey, if I bring people next week, you know, you think you can give me some money? First party, 800 people came. There, you know, what really triggered it wasn't the college parties. It was an actor who showed up at that party who showed me the other side of Atlanta, because Atlanta was segregated at that point. White people were listening to techno, and their clubs, and black people who listen to hip hop, and you didn't really see black and white together in a nightclub. And an actor named Jason Weaver uh, showed up at my party, and I knew who he was, because he's always on that VH1 Michael Jackson family movie. Mm -hmm. He plays mm -hmm. a little Michael. Jason said, you want to see how the other, other half lives? I was like, what are you talking about? And he brought me to Velvet Room Tuesday nights. And that's where I met Alex Gidewan, who uh, was the biggest promoter to that scene in Atlanta, and he taught me how to promote. So. You drop out in your sophomore year of college? Yeah. Um, After Jermaine gives me the job. Okay, well, how do you meet Jermaine? Everybody in Atlanta would come kind of, kind of to my parties because I had access to all the college kids and that's a great place to break your records or see if they're working. And we also just had fun parties where it was just a lot of different types of people. Jermaine started coming and then he, at the time he was dating Janet and he started bringing Janet to the parties. And then one day he calls me and he's like, can you come meet me? at Eddie Skeeter Rock's birthday, who was his best friend since middle school, and who was the head of A&R at So So Def. And we go to this place, this lounge, and he takes me into the downstairs to talk alone. And there's stools. And Jermaine is, is not the tallest gentleman in the world. So he, I'll never forget, he gets on this stool and he's talking to me, but I'm more fascinated that his legs are going like this because they can't touch the floor. <laughs> and I'm kind of just like trying to like pay attention, but also being like, he's not that tall. <laughs> but he's like, I want you to come, you know, work with me and I want to show you like the other side and like, you know, Russell found Lior, you're going to be my little Lior. 
within six months, I was the vice president of marketing. I ended up dropping out of school. You know, you're 20 years old and he puts that puffy so-so def jacket on you, that starter mm -hmm. style jacket. It's his scooter with the big so-so def. Like I was wearing that to the college bar. Like, I just thought it was the man. How did your parents take you dropping out of school? So for the first year, they didn't know. Uh, where, where were those tuition checks going? Well, I was paying. Oh, okay. I said to my parents, you know, because I'm doing this business and you guys don't really understand it, I want to show you how lucrative it is. I want to pay the bills. But I wasn't going to class. And um, I didn't want to tell them, so I wanted the mail to keep going to them. So I actually paid until they kicked me out because I was so afraid to tell them. But I wasn't going to school. I was dropped out, but just paying Emory to send my parents mail. <laughs> and they call me in to meet with this academic advisor. And I go and I sit with him. And at first, the first couple minutes is him like trying to see if I have a drug problem or see if there's something really horrible going on in my life. Like, what is the cause of this drop? And I said, no, it's nothing like that. I'm actually an entrepreneur. I'm working. I'm trying to build something for myself. And Emory isn't conducive to the lifestyle that I'm living trying to do this. And he stops me and he says, I want to tell you a story. And he tells me this story about Robert Woodruff, who's the number one endowment to Emory University. I'm sitting there thinking, this is amazing. He gets me. This guy is going to help me be like Robert Woodruff. And at the end of it, he looks at me and he goes, and I want you to understand, stories like that are amazing, but they're one in a billion. <laughs> so I want to get you back on the right track. And I just kind of like got real quiet. It hit me that he was basically shitting on my dream. <laughs> I'll never forget, I, I raised my hand and I said, I really understand what I have to do now and I really appreciate you taking the time. He says, we're gonna get you back on track. I said, with all due respect, sir, I think I have to do something for myself first. So I'm, I'm withdrawing from Emory University. What is it like working at SoSo -So Deaf in, what is this, 2000, 2001? Like peak? Yeah, 2001, 2002, yeah. Peak era. It was awesome. I mean, a lot of people don't know this about Jermaine Dupri, but um, he broke Quincy's record. He had 16 years where he had at least one number one on the Hot 100 chart, straight. They know he's a great producer, but they don't give him the credit for what he really achieved as a producer. He's one of the best that ever did it. And he gave me a shot. He put me in the game and I was kind of his right hand. I was fine. I was helping with the music marketing, but I was also finding other opportunities for him. What, is, what does that mean yet? Yeah, I mean, to run marketing at a, at a sort of boutique label like that? I mean, look, we, we told the label what we wanted to do, kind of the way my company does now. So when we had a project, we kind of, I'd write the marketing plan. I'd kind of figure it out. The funny thing was though, Jermaine was afraid that I would get hired by one of the companies in New York. So I would have to write my whole marketing plan then I'd have to sit with Jermaine and walk him through everything. And then he would leave me in Atlanta and fly up and present. Because <laughs> he didn't want them knowing I existed. But then people slowly started to figure out and like a lot of our artists were saying like, I was their go-to guy because I spent the most time with Jermaine. So your time with Jermaine Dupri comes to a close, somewhat abruptly. <laughs> what exactly happened? Um, I think the last year, Working for Jermaine, I had all these ideas about how to use social media to break acts and really no one was listening to me and I was becoming repeatedly frustrated. Um, and I, uh, I got really good advice from two people. One was my dad, again, who told me, look, if you're gonna work for someone else, at the end of the day, you could be frustrated, but it's their company. But if you wanna do it on your own, your own way, you gotta leave and do it your own way. And the other person was Little John. So I'm in London at a place called Cabaret, which was like the hot nightclub of London at the time. John and I start talking, and a lot of people don't know this, but John actually worked at Sosa Def for 12 years and uh, as an A&R. And he used to have something called the Sosa Def Base All-Stars, which was the beginning of Little John. He told me for 12 years, I tried to get Jermaine to let me be Little John and do that, but he just wanted me to be an A&R. Don't take 12 years. That really sat with me of like, you gotta do your own thing. But I was a kid, I'm the youngest VP, that, you know, in music at a boutique label, but the hottest label around and we're killing it. Jermaine's executive producing Usher, Confessions, and Emancipation of Mimi for Mariah. And we're having all these hits. And I was afraid to just leave. Like you get, you get stagnant because you, you work so hard to build an identity, it's hard to walk away. So one day I came to the office and Jermaine's mom was there and she liked to be involved with the business stuff. And um, she just kind of starts telling us all that we all are just abusing her son, that he could do this all without you guys. And just kind of random, like she just saying this stuff. And it was a little frustrating. So I said, look, Tina, I already had a business before this. Like, 
I really don't appreciate you saying that because it's demeaning to me and the rest of the staff. Like, I don't know why you're doing that. And she said something that was um, very uncalled for, that out of respect for Jermaine and to her, I will not repeat it. I told her that there's a lot of things I could say in response, but out of respect for her and her son, I'm just gonna leave because I don't wanna say something I regret. And I left the office to, you know, just stay calm. I actually saw Jermaine that night, hung out. Next day I show up at the office and there's a letter, you know, in my mailbox in my office. And I, I take it out and she has released me from my job. And it's signed by her. But then I look over, it's also signed by Jermaine. So she went to him and said, so I'm just like, are you kidding me? And there was no vibe like this when you were hanging out the previous night? No. So I, I literally go back and I'm like, dude, what? The? And he's like, man, just give it a few weeks. That was it for me. You know, I was kind of like, give it a few weeks. Like, I've dedicated myself to this. Like, I've killed for you. Like, you're big bro. You know, I don't, I don't like that feeling. So I said, I got to go out on my own. A couple other things happened, you know, that were very life-changing for me. Um, someone who I'd done business with, who I was friendly with, got killed. Um, and I was with him 15 minutes before it happened. Just certain things in my life that made me say, are you living up to your potential? And my brother was backpacking countries randomly. I kept reading his blog entry because that's how I'd keep up with him. He'd go to a cafe and write something and he's a great writer. One day I just wrote him back and I said, how much to meet you where you are and what do I need? And he sent me a list. I went to a store, I filled the backpack up, bought a one-way ticket to Chile. And I get to this hostel and my brother's like, yeah, just put your bag there and we sleep there. And these strangers who are showing up sleep in the other beds. And I'm like, they're gonna rob us while we're sleeping. And my brother looks at me and he's like, you just gotta trust people. That's the whole point of doing this. And I was like, this is stupid. In Atlanta, Atlanta made me hard. You know, there were no contracts as a cash party promoter. So it was like, your word was everything. And you couldn't really trust people. So you were always looking over your shoulder, looking for, you know, who's the snake. But by the end of the trip, I understood that shit's gonna happen no matter what you do in life. You can be preventative to a certain extent, but you also gotta like put your trust in people to, you know, it's better to go through life believing in the goodness of people. And um, that shift happened for me when I came back. I was rejuvenated and I was ready to start my company and that's when I started it. I signed Asher and four months later found Justin. The universe responded to Scooter once he found his emotional center. He'd mined two diamonds in the rough, but now he had to polish them in order to convince the world. When you found those two first acts, what, what was it about them that made them jump off the screen? So um, Shaka Zulu, Ludacris' manager, and I went to a Hawks game. And we were talking about how I'm starting my own thing. And he said, look, most people get one their whole career. You're lucky if you get two. So really just focus on one. So I was like, I'm gonna get two because then I'm gonna show people like I'm for real. So I basically sat down, I looked for a gap in the marketplace and I chose three different types of acts. One was what Asher was, which was someone who could really, really rap, but spoke to the white boy that Asher was, um, that loved hip hop, but didn't have anybody like them in hip hop, like, you know, wearing flip flops. The other was this idea of the young Michael Jackson, big Michael Jackson fan. So when Michael was singing these angelic songs, you actually believed in love before you became an adult and got jaded because you had the angelic voice of a child speaking about love from the time you remembered it. And that's the whole, you know, Justin filled. And then the other one I never found. And it was just, uh, it was like Britney meets Pink, the best way I could probably describe it. <laughs> and uh, I saw Asher on MySpace by chance, by mistake actually. Um, and I heard him rap and I was like, what is this? And at the time, like the image was all wrong because he was just trying too hard. What, what was the image? It was like he had the hoodie real low and like he was, you know, he was trying to be hard. But when I met him, he was just a kid hanging out in college. Like it wasn't hard at all. And I was just like, I want you to be that. Be the college kid. Um, and when I found Justin, it was also by mistake. And a lot of people know that story, finding him on YouTube. It's 60,000 views. You know, I was just like, man, this kid can sing with such soul and he has this angelic voice. When I met him, that was that. He was the most charismatic kid I'd ever met in my life. So I was like, I'm gonna focus on these two. I had my life set out for 13 months before I went broke. 
and I said, no more parties, cold turkey. Month 11, I had Justin and his mom living in a small, tiny townhouse around the corner from me that I'm paying all the bills. I got all the furniture in there from Aaron's rents. I'm paying his schooling. I'm paying hockey. Like, everything's coming out of me. And, and, so, like, and all this money is? My money from parties and from what I was associated with. Like, I, and I have Asher in a house a block away from him with his buddies that he brought with him. I'm paying all their bills, their rent, their everything. And on month 11 of 13, when I'm done, I'm broke. My dad actually called me, I was 25. And he's like, how's things going? We start talking and I just broke down crying. And I was like, dad, I'm done. Like I'm two months away from being done. And I'm a failure and no one knows. And my dad was like, you've come this far, just see it through. He said, you got two more months, see what happens. The next day Asher came in and played me out of college. And the publishing deal saved our company. It just shows you how close success and failure lie. You know, and that when you're at that really that breaking point, that's when you push a little bit further. When you find Justin, what is your wildest dream of what is gonna happen for him? I knew that I could make this kid the biggest artist in the world. Like I knew exactly what to do. It was like the big men upstairs just threw the whole game plan in my head. What was it like trying to uh, articulate and convince the rest of the world because I imagine, that, you know, it seems like a foregone conclusion now, but at the time... Oh yeah, for two years no one listened to me. Like, I didn't, Justin's first single didn't come out till he was 15 and a half. I found Justin when he was almost about to turn 13. I found him with 60,000 views. I didn't even show Usher till it was 66,000, 66 million views. And Usher, the truth, when I walked into L.A. Reid's office and we pitched Justin, Usher wasn't even a part of the project. He set up the meeting and I said, if it goes through, I'll make you a part of the project. So that's actually how it happened. Like, like I was talking to him and Timberlake at the same time, trying to get one of them to bite. Um, because I like put my all into this kid and I believed in it so much. And I just found, like Justin was my family. When he was 13, I made a promise to him I would never let him down, never leave him. And like I, I felt like I had to keep that promise. And everyone said no to us. I mean, the funny thing, like, L.A. Reid in the meeting was like, I want the kid, but why didn't the contract come for six months? Because he didn't want the kid. He was telling the A&R, who I was close with there, like, what am I supposed to do with this kid? But I was forcing it down his throat that he was going to take him. And I literally, when he, to get the contract finally done, I went to Tricky Stewart and basically made the first album between friendships that I had in Atlanta and brought it into L.A. and said, the album is now done. All I need you to do is sign it and put out a video. What was the point that you felt like this is all going to work? I know for my mom, when she finally understood what I did for a living, we were at the Garden, we were at Z100, um, Jingle Ball, and Justin was like the fourth act in, it was his first Jingle Ball, and John Mayer, while he was performing, they started chanting, Justin, Justin, and John goes, I know what you guys are here to see. I'll do one more song and I'll leave. <laughs> and he leaves and they just chanted for him. And my mom looked at me and she goes, I get it now. When you look at your business and how it grew, what do you think the sort of most important inflection points were for you? I used to think when I was younger that fear was my number one driver, like fear of failure. And as I've gotten older and I've actually reflected on the moments in my life that are the most influential, fear has never been the driver. I've always been kind of the way I am. Um, the number one driver is disrespect. When people disrespect me, I make a move. When people told me I couldn't make something out of social media with artists and couldn't do the A&R on it, I did that. When someone told me when I had these artists where they were, yeah, he's good, but he's only done that. I immediately was like, what? So I went out and signed, you know, The Wanted with Glad You Came, Call Me Maybe with Carly Rae Jepsen and Gangnam Style within six months of each other because I wanted acts that I could break immediately just to prove that person wrong. And then they were like, oh, now they're, you know, those, you know, acts that it just comes real quick. Like, I was like, okay, I'll sign career artists. I'll sign acts that I build over time. I'll sign Tori Kelly. You know, I'll build Martin from a 17-year-old kid to one of the top DJs in the world in this company. And like, oh, you can only do one genre. Okay, EDM with Martin, Dan and Shay, three number ones at country. Like, I never really make a five-year plan. I just wait for people to talk shit. After Justin's initial success, his career in certain ways continues to go through the roof with the movie and all of these things, but eventually as he becomes a later adolescent... When he uh, turns 18, we had a rough patch, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, let's talk about that. <laughs> so, 
We actually did a cover right around that time uh, for Complex. What happened? Look, I think um, that's his story to tell. And I think at the right time, he'll tell the complete story. I think, you know, funny enough, his perspective and maybe some of us who are there are going to be very different because a lot of it he doesn't remember. Um, you know, it was a, just a very tough time. And what I can tell you is I learned a lot during that time about patience. I learned a lot about um, dealing with someone else who's going through that. At the end of the day, I failed. Because if it was up to me, for a year and a half, none of that would have happened. But for a year and a half, I tried everything and I failed because he was still in that dark place. And it wasn't until one day something happened that he called me and he said, this happened and enough is enough, I need to make a change. And he asked me to help him with that change because I've been doing the research and had the resources to do so. And I helped, but what you learn in that process is that you can help someone as much as you want, but they have to make the conscious, conscious decision that they want to make a change. Did you ever feel like this might be over? To me, the only point where I had where is it over wasn't a scary career over. I thought I was gonna lose him. I thought he was gonna die, you know? And that was the scariest point because he was an adult so he could go away from me. I couldn't force him to stay next to me. And there were points where I didn't know if in the morning he was gonna be there. And I was petrified and I was doing everything I could. And, um, and I think he knows that. And I think, uh, you know, at the end of the day, for him to come out of that and be where he is today is a testament to his, to his strength. A little over a year ago, you took on Kanye West as a client. It seems like the two of you have formed a real kinship. What is the sort of secret to the success of that relationship? I think the secret to that relationship, or the secret to any relationship, is respect. I have the utmost respect for him. I've worked with a lot of different people, and he is very special. He's a genius. Like, creatively, he's an absolute genius. He's a really good person. And he's a good guy, you know, have these moments publicly behind closed doors. The guy's an amazing listener and just a good human being. I don't want to speak too much to it because I, I have a lot of respect for him. Um, but, I, but I can tell you, for all those fans out there who are constantly, you know, rooting for Kanye, he's worth rooting for. He's a great guy. When you started, you had Asher living around the corner, Justin living down the block. It was probably fairly easy to give them your total focus and attention. And, you know, they probably felt that. You now have, you know, a dozen acts, perhaps more. More than two dozen. TV shows, <laughs> charity relief things, uh, rumors of running for office, all kinds of stuff going on. Um, how do you make each client feel your presence? You know, a lot of it is their day-to-day -day managers and making sure their relationship's there and they know that I'm there for the big phone calls. You know, the struggle is where your priorities lie. You know, because I want to help all these people and I want to stick to my commitments, but also the climate of the world has changed. Look, politics is the best place for us to talk about it because that's where our world leaders are. And my biggest issue, which I wish, I wish I could ignore because then I could focus on the real issues like, like climate change, like bail reform, like education, like all these things that I really care about. Um, my biggest issue is that I got kids. And I'm living in a time where if I put my kids in front of a television and the President of the United States is speaking, I'm afraid to leave them alone in the room because of issues of morality. You might not like the President of the United States, but I think we all agree that there are certain moral standards that we expect from the most powerful position in the world. If my son comes to me and says, Daddy, I called a girl a pig, I'd be like, why would you do that? Well, the president said it. You know, daddy, um, you know, I, I said this about Mexicans. Why do you do that? The president said it. Daddy, are all Muslims, like, do we need to make sure they don't come here? Should we never let a Muslim in our house? Why you say it? The president said it. What I'm tired of is that person making it seem like the people that we're yelling at are people we should be yelling at. It's the same people we're claiming to help. It's a distraction. Do you see a, a role for yourself in government? Right now, I have a responsibility to the people I make commitments to, and I have a fiscal responsibility to my company, and that's what I need to do. And as a private citizen, I need to stay where I am, and I also need to continue to do things as a private citizen that I don't have any red tape. 
you know, what, what happened in Manchester and what, how we reacted, I don't think many politicians could do because there's so much red tape. What happened with our telethon, where we were able to take action within 10 days, there was no red tape. Bun B called me, we went into action, that was that. So I think there's a lot of things people can do as private citizens that I'm gonna continue trying to do. With vision, persistence, and a dash of stubbornness, Scooter silenced critics with success. But along the way, he learned that each client has their own goals and their own road to travel. So what happened with Asher? They say the oldest kid, you know, all the mistakes are made on. Mm -hmm. If I made mistakes, I made mistakes with Asher. I got it to a certain point and then I started kind of just trusting the process of the label. But how we got there was just doing it our way. And then when we got around that, Asher was just, the fame came so quick that he didn't really want that. Asher wanted to be an elementary school teacher. So he kind of slowed it all the way down and was like, I don't want what you want. You want me to be one of the biggest acts in the world. I don't want that. And he and I actually had a very, probably one of the most interesting talks in, in, you know, for me in my life, where we were hanging out probably like six or eight months ago at my house. One thing led to another. And I just said, listen, I just gotta tell you I'm sorry. Because I just feel like I could have taken it further. And, and he looked at me and he was like, are you crazy? And he goes, you called me out of a house in the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania, I thought I would never leave that area. I just got done from a European tour, and now I got my own life. He goes, you don't owe me anything. And he said, and he literally yelled at me, he's like, that's your problem. You think you gotta put everyone else's dreams on your shoulders. He goes, you already changed my life. I made my own decisions. And he goes, and if you can't get everyone where you think they need to be, that's on them, not on you. And it was kind of eye-opening, because this whole time I thought there was some kind of resentment. We were friends, but I always felt like I let him down. And he let me know that it wasn't anything like that. How do you navigate giving people, you know, the artists you work with, honest feedback without sort of messing up their mojo? One of my mentors taught me a long time ago that every single artist that I help and that I love will and could eventually fuck me over. I've come to terms with that, so if I have to tell them the, t the truth and that is my demise, okay, so be it. You, you know, whether it's you know Justin or Ariana or people I'm so close with that are like family, one day that is gonna happen. It's, has it ha ever happened yet? Ariana, Ariana left me because I told her the truth and she got very upset with me and like, and I told her my truth, it might not have been her truth, but I told her my truth and she got it, super upset. I can't go into what it was, okay. but basically she fired me. And six months later, I took, you know, I, I didn't badmouth her, I didn't say anything. Six months later, she came back, we had a talk, and she's like, I'm sorry about that. Like, let's get back to where we're, and we're actually closer than we've ever been. And I've always understood that life is like this, so I'm fully ready to catch a brick at any moment. Um, and at this point in my life, like, I think catching a brick is inevitable. Like I had a really close friend of mine, Benny Blanco, here yesterday, and he brought Mike Posner as another close friend. And I said to them, you know, I really feel lately like I've had a target on my back. Like people just want to see me fail, want to see my acts fail. And Mike, without even delaying, goes, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Benny's like, yeah, I've definitely heard stuff too. But I feel like it's inevitable. I feel like, you know, to, to, you, you gotta, you're gonna miss. And I feel like I'm gonna catch a brick soon. And the fun part is that's okay. Because that will mean another transition is happening and there'll be another you know, obstacle to climb. You know, now that I got my wife and I got my kids, I'm playing with house money. Like, you can't beat me. Like, as long as I got them, you can't beat me. I could literally have every act tell me to fuck off. I could drop everything, everything else, but I have stability in my life now in a way that I've never had before. So I can't be beat because you can't kill my happiness. Because my world used to be work. So whatever happened in my work life was my happiness. Now I'm finally having balance in my life where I'm still a workaholic, I can't change who I am. Asking for a friend, how do you manage that? <laughs> <laughs> you just keep trying. And knowing that that is your true salvation, you know, that that is the real balance. That like, why do we do this? Actually for this. So don't blow this. And I'm constantly screwing it up as far as like getting so you know, entrenched in myself that like luckily she helps me get out of that. 
and my kids help me get out of it. Because when my kids show up, no matter what I'm going through at work, how much success I'm having or how much failure, they don't care. They just want daddy. You know, so that's an amazing thing for balancing. Having achieved what you've achieved, do you ever think that there could be a number or something that would, you would just say, this was great? You mean financially? Yes. Well, actually, we talk about this all the time. Because I ask people to say a number to me. I never, okay. That's a good question. What, what is the number that you would just check out and go hang out with your, your kids all day long? <laughs> um, I had a number. I wanted to be a billionaire when I got to college. You know, I started doing business. And then I was like, yo, making five grand is really hard. <laughs> so I changed my number. Um, I met somebody who had a life that I admired and wasn't like on any list. But I just thought, wow, what a great life, what a great guy. And I asked him how much to get to here. And he told me. And when I was 20, and that number in my mind was, I'll get there when I'm in my 50s. I'll work my whole life and eventually I'll get there. And when I was 27, I was driving down Peachtree Road by Cactus Car Wash. And my accountant called me and about some investment I made and it came back. And um, I said, how much money do I have across my, you know? And he named a number higher than that number. I was 27. I hung up the phone. I kept driving and then I pulled over and I called my dad. I seem to call my dad a lot during the <laughs> I said, I want to tell you something. And now I'm telling my father I'm the richest person in our family by far. And he's blown away, he's excited, and he goes, how do you feel? And I said, I feel really depressed. And he goes, why? I said, because I drove for a couple more minutes and I didn't feel anything. I wasn't happy, I wasn't sad, I just, my day kept going. He said, I want you to call me back and tell me all the things that made you happy over the last year. Just call me back and think about it. Hung up, thought about it, called him back. I was gonna say, sounds cliche, it's when I'm playing ball with my friends, when I'm just hanging out, when I'm going to a children's hospital, when I'm talking to people randomly on a Facebook message board and like helping them out, like when I'm going, you know, giving out tickets at the shows, the cliche, corny stuff. Mm -hmm. My dad goes, money's an avenue to freedom you have an opportunity to implement more of that into your life to make you happy. The money's not gonna make you happy. And I never forgot that. So as I've continued to go on and on and on, the answer to your question is, I got there a long time ago, but I'm not doing it for money. I'm doing it because I feel like I should. I still feel like there's a need. And I'm, it's giving me the ability to more implement more happiness into my life every single year as I get better at balance. What do you think the characteristic in you that has inspired people to want to invest in you? I think they've invested in me because they see some of themselves in me. Um, but also, you gotta share a common interest with someone. You know, you gotta share a love of family, a love of sports, a love of music. Like, there has to be something you share a common interest so that there's a reason for them to enjoy the conversation. Um, the biggest thing I've learned though, is that the mistake of youth is thinking that, that the mentors you need are older than you. That, you. that you should work hard on getting in a room with some powerful person, because that's gonna change your life. It's just not the truth. What changes your life is your peers. Because if you go to any powerful person and you ask them a question or ask them to help you out, you know what they do? They say the same thing every time. Oh, let me call them. I've been friends with them for 20, 30, 40 years. The people you rise up with are your power base, not the person who's already done it. You talked a couple times about the role that social media played in, in, your, in, in your life. It created a ton of opportunities for people in our generation. Completely. As you get older though, you know, the edge that you had from being right there at that moment starts to ebb, right? Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? I'm not naive. I acknowledge the fact that the older I get, this is youth-driven business. And the older I get, I gotta take on new adventures and I gotta hire young people and say, trust your gut. Like, it doesn't last forever. You know, and if I'm holding on to one identity for the rest of my life, that's pretty shitty. All I can do is find the next young person and be like, look, I'm gonna let you skip a step I didn't have. I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have somebody backing me. I gotta figure it out on my own. You don't need to waste that time. Like, I believe in you, go. Like, use my Rolodex. You know, use me, go. And that's probably the best way I stay relevant. 
When you look at your career from, you know, throwing the parties, working at Sosa Def, working with Justin, to throwing charity fundraisers, telethons, like what, what are the attributes about your personality that you think are most important for your success and along the way? It's like imagine you go to Yankee Stadium, they hand you a bat, and a Cy Young Award winner is standing, you know, there pitching. And they say, if you can hit a home run off this Cy Young Award winner, you win the big prize. And, but here's the deal, everyone in the world can take as many swings as they want and get in line as many times as they want. So of course, everyone in the whole city, people are driving in, they're all lining up. Most people aren't even gonna swing. They're gonna say, there's no way I can hit a home run off a Cy Young Award winner, they're gonna stay home. Then people are gonna come and they're gonna take one swing, hear everybody booing them, give them someone else a chance, and they're gonna put the bat down and they're gonna leave. Then you're gonna have the person who takes 10 swings and the place is gonna be booing like crazy. Give someone else a chance, you bomb, there's hundreds of people, thousands of people waiting in line, and they're gonna give up and put the bat down. Then you get the one person who literally hears the boos, hears the hate, and keeps swinging, and keeps swinging, and keeps swinging. And everyone is like, this is the worst scumbag in the world, I hate you, give someone else a chance, What? you're such a jerk. And, and for six hours this goes on. And finally, they hit a home run. No one remembers all the nonsense. They say, that guy stuck in there and he or she hit the home run. Most people don't wanna keep swinging. They just hear all the noise around them and they give up. I think kind of the mentality my parents put, put in me is I wanna keep swinging. I don't really care what you're talking about. I don't care if you're hating on me or talking trash. I know what my mission is. I know what I'm there to do. And that's what I'm gonna do. So I hope people get that. Like if you want success, you just gotta keep swinging and there's gonna be a lot of noise and a lot of hate along the way. But when you get that one hit, that one home run, that's all anyone remembers anyway.